So the assumption is, well, um, in a human, when we're in danger, we're both afraid and our heart is beating faster and we're freezing or fleeing. Therefore, the fear must be what causes those responses. So when we see a rat freezing and its heart beating fast in the presence of a dangerous stimulus, the rat must be afraid in the way we're afraid. And Darwin told us that we've inherited these emotions like fear from our animal ancestors by virtue of having inherited something in the nervous system of those animals. And now we know that thing that he was talking about was the amygdala. But he was wrong to say that that was an emotion. Those are behavioral and physiological responses. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Chasing Consciousness. Today, we're going to be exploring the way emotions work, and particularly fear, uh, the way it's triggered, uh, what happens in the brain, and how much we're actually conscious of what's going on during that process. I think this is really, really relevant as we appear to be an extremely fearful, defensive, and, and argumentative bunch. And perhaps if we can understand this uh, and understand what's happening inside us, we might be able to limit some of the damage uh, that these kind of encounters produce in our lives. We're also going to be taking a look at the limbic system and try and brain theories of emotions and the evolution of the brain and finding out why these hugely popular theories in psychology are no longer really considered true by neuroscientists. Perhaps we can salvage something useful from these theories for psychology as some really quite brilliant therapies have been based on them in the past. So who better to help us clarify all of this than emotion and fear specialist, neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux. Dr. Ledoux is the Henry and Lucy Moses Professor of Science at NYU in New York in the Center of Neuroscience. And he also directs the Emotional Brain Institute of NYU and the Nathan Klein Institute. He's also a professor of psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry at NYU Langone Medical School. His work focuses mostly on the brain mechanisms of memory and emotion, and he is the author of several books, uh, The Emotional Brain, Synaptic Self, and Anxious. And his most recent book that we'll be talking mostly about today, The Deep History of Ourselves. He's received loads of awards, um, so many I'm not going to list them, uh, but they are included, uh, including prizes from the Association of Psychological Science, the American Philosophical Society, the Ibsen Foundation, and the American Psychological Association. And his book, Anxious, received the 2016 James, William James Book Award from the American Psychological Association. Awesomely, he's also the lead singer and songwriter in the rock band The Amygdaloids, and he performs with Colin Dempsey as the acoustic duo So We Are. So I am really extremely um, grateful to have such an experienced specialist to help us clarify all of this. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. So, Dr. Joseph Ledoux, welcome to Chasing Consciousness. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you? Well, thank you for having me, Freddie. It's, uh, looking forward to it. Well, we've got uh, some really quite chunky stuff to get into. But before we get into the main discussion for today, uh, I always ask this because I'm so curious about people's personal journey. I'd, I'd like to ask you, what were the really burning questions for you personally as you sort of started your conscious life, if you like, in your youth that may have in some way worked their way into your, your choice of career in psychology and neuroscience? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, when I was a kid, I, I loved music, and that's uh, kind of what I was interested in. Uh, I was a disc jockey in high school. Of course, you know, the, I was a teenager when the Beatles hit town. And um, so that's what fascinated me. And I was kind of aimless and went to college and uh, got an undergraduate degree and a very obvious choice for someone going into science, which is uh, business administration. And then I got a master's in marketing. 
And, you know, I really didn't enjoy the the studying those things very much. It was the late 60s, and it certainly wasn't cool to have those kinds of degrees. Um, um, but in the process of studying marketing, I found, the only thing I found interesting was, uh, you know, why people buy the junk they buy. And so I wanted, I wanted to, like, become a kind of consumer protectionist, uh, Ralph Nader kind of thing back then. And so I... I got more and more into like consumer psychology and that took me into real psychology. And pretty soon I was taking a course with a guy studying the brain, which I didn't know you could do. Uh, this is, you know, I was a, just a kid from a small town in Louisiana. I didn't know much about science or the brain. And uh, I, I just fell in love with that uh, possibility. We published a couple of papers together in the year I, I worked with him. And then I decided to go to graduate school in um, uh, kind of psychobiology, I think it was called at the time. There was no neuroscience, the field of neuroscience was just very, barely beginning in the, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. So it um, seems more that you kind of stumbled into the question yeah. somehow. And in my stumbles, I ended up uh, at Stony Brook, where Mike Zaniga, who you've had on your show, took me in as a graduate student and became my mentor. And that's, uh, you know, the rest is uh, history, I guess. Well, and we're certainly going to be speaking about quite a, quite a bit of that uh, uh, now. So before we get onto your recent book, uh, The Deep History of Ourselves, beautiful title. Oh, but I wanted to ask you a question. How did you get into this? Well, <laughs> it's so wonderful to be asked that by You're an actor. And so, uh... <laughs> yeah, I know. It's strange, isn't it? I think there are searchers and uh, people asking the big questions from all walks of life. And I rather like the idea that an actor and a model is coming to these ideas um, with as much passion and perhaps naivety as your average member of the public. Um, I did study philosophy and I've always um, wanted to get answers to these kind of questions. But I think more recently, I'm just, I just really feel that, that we've got some damage in our society we've got some things wrong i think there's lots of amazing discoveries from science from the last 50 100 years that we haven't really assimilated yet and i think that if we did we could really uh, uh solve quite a lot of those problems or at least be more responsible in the way we manage them so that's really where i'm coming from like certainly could be more responsible as a world that's for sure absolutely well maybe we'll get into some of that later on okay so before we come to your your new book, The Deep History of Ourselves, as I was saying, beautiful title, by the way, and The Evolution of Consciousness, I want to spend a little time setting the scene in one of your other areas of specialization, emotions, and, and particularly fear and the way we deal with threat. In this first series, what we're trying to do is establish where science has got up to and uh, get the wider public to update our worldview to match those findings. And an area where I think a lot of us lack awareness is how we process threat and the way we naturally react to it. Uh, at the moment, online and in the real world, um, particularly when we're children, we're, we're constantly made to feel unsafe. And, and I think we could all benefit from understanding that process of physical and emotional response and both from the point of view of how we raise and educate children, uh, I know you're also a child psychiatrist, and from the point of view of mediating that triggering and that overreaction, maybe diffusing some of these problems. Can you explain a bit about the amygdala, um, uh, the famous fear center, which um, I know that you're, uh, you're, you're slightly questioning in your work. What happens in the body when we perceive a threat? And, and is it the emotion of fear that stimulates the physical response? Or are they two separate systems? Well, I think you kind of put your finger on the, the button there. So, you know, I, I've worked on the amygdala since, uh, I don't know, mid-1980s. Um, published hundreds of papers on it. Um, and I went into this amygdala research coming right out of the split brain research from uh, with Mike Gazanagar, maybe a couple of years doing something else in the middle, but pretty close to that. But the, the Gazanaga, the work I did with Gazanaga 
was just so influential in shaping my naive mind, having no science background, really. No, I had never taken science courses. And I got no scientific courses in graduate school either, really, the one or two, you know, like statistics or something. Um, and the, the whole process was um, uh, just one of learning stuff on the job. And so I was able to you know, go through graduate school without any kind of science education. I never had any sense either. So it's been on the job training the whole way through. You know, I'm not saying that in the kind of boastful way. It's just how my life uh, proceeded. And um, when I got to the amygdala research, the thought that I carried with me from the split brain research was this, that um, our emotions, our conscious experiences that result from our cognitive interpretation of the situations we're in. Now, this was based on a finding that Mike and I um, made in the split brain patients in, I think we published it in, oh, we published a book in 1978 called The Integrated Mind, and it was certainly in there, and we put you know, some papers on it as well. So the basic idea was that, you know, when you present a stimulus to the right hemisphere of a split brain patient, um, that part of the brain, that side of the brain doesn't have language, uh, doesn't have the ability to speak. So that information is over there. And because the brain has been split, sectioned in, in half, basically cutting the fibers between the two hemispheres to help these poor people who've had usually, you know, kids who have had epilepsy all their life so bad that, you know, they have no life at all. They're just like constantly seizing and the drugs are not helping them. So this is a radical procedure. And so when the brain is split like this, the left hemisphere where you can speak, where the patient could speak, is isolated from the right hemisphere. So if you put a stimulus into the right hemisphere and you say, what's there? What did you see? The guy says, I didn't see anything. So, but if, you know, let's say it's a picture of an apple or a banana or something, and let's say it's an apple. So the guy can say, well, reach in the bag and see if you find it. So the left hand goes in the bag. And if it was a picture of an apple, it finds that thing and pulls the apple out. And you say, why'd you do that? Oh, I don't know. I, I guess I was hungry or something. You know, it would make up some kind of story. But yeah, this you know, is exactly still, what we spoke to Mike about, the left brain yeah. interpreter. What a discovery, guys. I mean, that must have been so baffling and so worrying okay. for consciousness. Yeah, the, the, the key finding, though, was when we put a stimulus on both sides of the brain. Uh, you know, both sides of the screen. So one went to the left hemisphere and one, so one went to the left hemisphere and one went to the right hemisphere. When that happens, the hands come out and point to things. You know, we had a bunch of pictures out there. And so each hemisphere pointed to a picture that matched what it saw. And now we, we asked the left hemisphere, why'd you do that? And he said, well, you know, I saw a, a chicken claw so I pointed to the chicken as the left hemisphere, seeing what's over here on the right side of, the, of space. And I, and you know, because it, I, there was a chicken, you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed, <laughs> which is the shovel, the, the, what the right hemisphere saw was a snow scene, right? So he, he didn't talk, he didn't know, the left hemisphere didn't know anything about the snow scene. He just saw his hand pointing to a shovel next to a chicken and said, oh, you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shed. And so we, from there, we came up with this idea that, that consciousness is a narration uh, of our, our, our behavior, trying to make our behavior make sense because we aren't consciously aware of everything our body does. And so we went to the bar that night and having a Jack Daniels, which we had in this other, that was our standard uh, operating mode after the, the day. Uh, we were up in Vermont where the patients were, you know, so we were away from home and we'd just go into the bar and have a drink. And we were talking about what, you know, what could this all mean? And so we said, well, maybe the emotion systems in the brain are systems that are responding unconsciously all the time to stimuli and that our, uh, that, you know, our conscious mind then has to narrate that because it's disturbing to think for your body to be responding all the time in ways you don't know why. So what one of the things consciousness does for us is like 
you know, make sense of our lives, our behaviors and everything else around us. So this was based on, uh, you know, kind of a takeoff on Leon Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance. Festinger was a good friend of mine. And anyway, so, you know, when you when you leave split brain research after graduating, um, you don't have a bunch of patients to work on yourself because, you know, that's your mentor's thing. You got to go out and find your own way in life. And uh, so what I wanted to do was pursue this idea that emotions are unconscious processes that generate behaviors or that they, that emotion systems generate behaviors unconsciously. And that the experience of the emotion, the feeling you have, the fear, is the result of the cognitive interpretation, the idea that the, the sense that you have, the conscious sense you have that you are in danger. Um, and so that's where your fear comes from, because if you don't know it's you that's going to be harmed, you know, what's there to be afraid of? So you have to be consciously in that mental experience in order to be afraid. So I always said, you know, if, uh, that the conscious experience of an emotion is a cognitive process, a cognitive interpretation. And the, uh, the behavioral and physiological responses that go along with that uh, occur unconsciously. And the, what the part of what the emotion is based on is the narration of those behavioral and physiological responses. If you're in a dangerous situation, your heart is beating fast, there's a, a bear or a snake or something or a mugger, uh, where else is your mind going to go? But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in danger, I'm afraid. You know? So it's, like, it's not like you say I'm afraid, it's just a narration like in the split brain patient. It just gets narrated out. And that's what you'd believe and feel. It's a belief that comes from an unconscious process. Those narrations are emerging out of a non-conscious process. So, for example, when you sit down to write something, you don't say, I am thinking that I am. You just write it out, right? It, you, it's, un, it's coming out, that script, that narration that you're writing is just coming out unconsciously. And consciously, you know what it is, because th that's part of what the conscious mind is, is this, the output of these narrations, these unconscious narrations. So, you know, some people say, well, is an emotion unconscious? I, not in the usual sense that we hear about it, in Freudian sense, uh, you know, like that we were impressed. It. I mean, maybe that exists, but that's not what I'm talking about. Unconscious emotion would be the the unconscious cognitive processes that are putting all that together. Now we're really jumping ahead because I know you want to maybe get into this later. So let's pause on that. Let me talk now back about the amygdala because all those years I've worked on the amygdala has led to me being introduced over the years as someone who's discovered how the conscious feeling of fear comes out of the amygdala. Why? Well, <clears throat> because the field has long talked about fear as the description of what happens, say, when a rat or a mouse is freezing to a dangerous stimulus, you know, maybe a tone that's been paired with a shock, or you know, maybe there's a cat with the, the mouse or the, the rat, uh, or some other kind of dangerous stimulus, snake in, the, in, in a cage would do it. I mean, you don't, you know, usually you don't expose animals to those actual harms like that. Uh, but, you know, there are ways of creating dangerous, threatening situations. And so the, the animal responds behaviorally by freezing or fleeing. His heart is beating fast. Uh, hormones are, are flowing out. All of the things that happen to us when we're in danger. So, um, and that's, if you damage, if the amygdala is damaged, then those things don't happen. So the assumption is, well, um, in a human, when we're in danger, we're both afraid and our heart is beating faster and we're freezing or fleeing. Therefore, the fear must be what causes those responses. So when we see a rat freezing and his heart beating fast in the presence of a dangerous stimulus, the rat must be afraid in the way we're afraid. And Darwin told us that we've inherited these emotions like fear from our animal ancestors by virtue of having inherited something in the nervous system of those animals. And now we know that thing that he was talking about was the amygdala. But he was wrong to say that that was an emotion 
those are behavioral and physiological responses. There are people, humans, who have you know, problems, literally lesions in their amygdala because of neurological conditions, um, who still report the feeling of fear. So fear can't be what's driving those responses. I can give you another example there. Psychologists have ways of presenting stimuli to people, say a visual stimulus, subliminally. You know, for example, you can flash it really quick and you can do other tricks to you know, kind of make sure it doesn't get into the conscious yeah, you, mind. You, you talk about masking. Um, yeah, using... masking. That would be like you present a picture of a snake and then immediately after, like a you know, 20 milliseconds after is a, a big bunch of white visual noise, just kind of nonsense stuff. And that kind of like, you know, kind of helps shunt it out of consciousness. So those but people that, aren't even aware they've experienced something that 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 could create fear. Right. So you say it's like the split brain patient the way you say, what did you see? And they say, I didn't see anything. But the amygdala but, lights up anyway in that case. Amygdala lights up, the heart is beating fast, their palms are sweating. You say, well, you know, your palms are sweating. Did you feel anything? No. You know, even if you push them, it, it was it some emotion? And no, you know, I, I didn't see anything. <laughs> um, and so, you know, if the if you don't need the amygdala to experience fear in a human, you shouldn't be calling upon fear to be the reason why the fear in the amygdala to be the reason why a rat or a mouse or any other animal is freezing to danger. Absolutely, or they do they seem need. to be two two quite quite separate systems there. Exactly. And does that go back if we go back in evolution? You know, do we find more simple creatures? I know it's hard to test, but do we find simpler non-mammalian creatures with a similar kind of ability to react um, without necessarily an emotion? Yes. Well, we don't I mean, we don't know what they experience, but we can certainly we know that every vertebrate animal, as fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, you know, primates all the way up, us has an amygdala it's like a, an old structure uh, and you know often we hear about you know the, the uh, lizard brain the amygdala is not in the lizard brain the lizard brain is actually lower the, the amygdala and all these structures hypothalamus all these things people have heard about are not in the lizard brain they're in the forebrain uh for the lizard brain is lower down yeah you know? in the so, case of the in the case of the patients that have are, are completely unaware of the fact that they have had their amygdala stimulated by the masked uh image of well, those are just those are patients just subject you know just, are, yeah just normal like people normal. in the case of those people um would you say that their brain has cognition of that threat no no, because it's um, not conscious. No, um, because cognition is a process of internal representation of stimuli. So what that means is that, um, well, let me give you an example in a, a kind of example that, that would come out of uh, uh, studies of rodents that have been put in different kinds of situations to receive food. This is the work of um, Anthony Dickinson at, at Cambridge, um, who has done remarkable work on, on this, which is to, um, it, what he says is that if you're looking at behavior, the behavior of a rat who's working to get some food from in the presence of some you know, kind of you know, light, when a light goes on, you press the bar to get the food and so forth, and more complicated things. I'm just giving a simple example. When you uh, observe the behavior, it's impossible to know simply by observing the behavior whether that rat is performing that response because it is, uh, it, it expects to get the goal to get the food, or because it's formed a stimulus response habit where even in the absence of the food coming, it keeps pressing the bar because it's habitual. You know, like, uh, I mean, an extreme example is addiction, where uh, the, the person is compulsive and behaviorally compulsive. Now, it's not the craving, the, the, the craving for the wonderful effects of the drug that are doing that. The habit has become stamped in as a behavioral response. The drug in, in the, at this point in the, the addict's life is no longer, you know, 
pleasant thing. It's kind of the, you know, the person will have, um, you know, may have, um, uh, have all sorts of symptoms when they're not getting the drug. And the, the, it's really about, you know, feeding the symptoms and, and keeping the symptoms down of, of withdrawal. So the person isn't is no longer in the mode where oh it's it's all wonderful, um, and so the same with the rat that is pressing the board to get through. It's a behavioral response. It's not a, a subjective driven subjectively driven experience. So habit versus goal directed behavior. Now, if you analyze which animals have habits and which animals have habits and goal directed behaviors. The cutoff is mammals. So reptiles have these behaviors where they, you know, will respond to rewards, but it's a it's a habitual response. Um, so what mammals have is the ability to represent the stimulus in memory, and the to represent the value of the stimulus in memory. So what Dickinson the way Dickinson showed this difference between habit and um, um, goal-directed behavior was to uh, train an animal to press the bar to receive um, uh, a certain food. And then um, after the animal learned how to do this, he devalued the food. In other words, what he did was he made the food taste bad or made the animal nauseous when it after it ate the food. Uh, regardless, by devaluing the food, now uh, if you are an animal that is responding habitually, if you've devalued the food, you still respond because it's not about the reward value. It's about you know the response. It's a behavioral habit. But if you are responding in a goal-directed behavior, when the stimulus is, when the, the reward has been devalued, you no longer respond. So that's the only way to tell the difference is to create, you know, little sophisticated tests like that in the animals and, and pull them apart. So, um, you know, we can't simply rely on behavior as an, a one-to-one -one map into what's going on as a mental uh, state. Absolutely. So rodents, mammals have these goal-directed uh, behaviors based on internal representations of stimuli, such as the value of stimuli and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, other animals below um, mammals don't seem to have that. So that's a cognitive process. That's like the most primitive kind of cognitive process. Higher levels of cognitive process are where you are not simply using the memory, but you're, con you're uh, of, on the basis of past learning, but are now using a kind of projection or a kind of deliberation or prediction about what's happening in this novel situation. You know, you don't have past learning about every possible situation you're in. You know, the goal-directed response is like specific to the situation. But if you're in a new situation, you might generalize a little bit, but if it's not exactly the same, you might have to deliberate, you know, sort of predict, well, Given what my brain knows now, this is where, what the best thing I should do is. And so these predictions um, are a higher level, still non-conscious kind of uh, uh, cognition. And then finally, you have uh, conscious deliberation where you, know, you can consciously mull over all of these things. So we don't need consciousness for a lot of what we do. You know, you're driving down the road, thinking about something else. And unless, you know, like all of a sudden you swerve off and you start here at the side of the road <laughs> making the noise in your tires, you went, oh my God, yeah, how did I do that? Well, you were, you know, just sort of cognitively assessing the environment and spatially mapping it and moving through it and making all the turns while mind wandering about something completely different. So we have these, these abilities to control our behavior non-consciously, uh, albeit cognitively, mm. uh, that are a step above um, being able to ha simply have habits. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, you know, once you have consciousness, though, that opens up a whole other realm of decision making and you know uh, information gathering and understanding about the world. So consciousness is not just a mirror. Is there a way we can separate cognition from emotion? Because yeah, if I understand correctly, this is one of your more testy claims. 
Yes, the the idea is that, you know, the usual idea is that uh, in the Darwinian model, you know, Darwin, of course, was was brilliant, a brilliant biologist, but, you know, it's been said he was a pretty sloppy psychologist. I mean, you know, he had no training, he'd just make it up, you know, it was all folk psychology. But because he was such a brilliant biologist, everything he said was, you know, loved and, and uh, fact. Believed. Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, so, um, you know, what what the Darwinian model says is, you know, the people who have pursued the Darwinian idea in in contemporary times say that, um, for example, the amygdala has been inherited from animals. And because of that inheritance, we and that's true, we have inherited it. uh, And with that, we got fear because fear uh, was an emotion that animals had. And Darwin knew this because he observed their behavior and they act, they behave the same as a human. So that, that's the flaw in the logic because I tell you the behavior's not a one-to-one representation in the in the mind. So um, you know, I I don't I don't think that the um, uh, that this kind of swelling up of neural activity in the amygdala is the cause of, of fear. Fear is a cognitive interpretation. And if fear is a cognitive interpretation, then before you could have an emotion, evolutionarily speaking, you had to have cognition. And so presumably that, these, these even very, very simple, you know, protozoas and, you know, small uh, single cell organisms like this, presumably they have some form of, of cognition of danger as well. I, would, I wouldn't say they have cognition because they don't have internal representations, the ability to mentally model the situation. What they have is... Well, let's talk about behavior. So the simplest kind of behavior in uh, in a vertebrate or in an animal, we'll say, uh, could be invertebrate or vertebrate, is a reflex. You know, you step on something sharp, you pull your leg back, withdrawal reflex. Hot thing, you pull your, arm, your hand back. So reflexes are totally wired in. You know, there's a stimulus that detects tissue damage in the skin and that goes into your spinal cord and pulls out a response. And it's just wired in like that. Mm. So that's the, the most basic, most primitive level. Mm. Above that, would, uh, and it's unconscious. The reflex is unconsciously controlled. So it's just whether you're thinking about it or not, you can't control it. Above that is a habit that we just talked about, mm-hmm. which is also unconsciously controlled. It's not something you intentionally do. I mean, you could have, you got, you do have conscious habits, but what we're talking about is conscious control of behavior and a, and a habit, behavioral habit is not consciously controlled. That takes us right up to the reptilian level, correct? Yeah, exactly, right. And so then with mammals, you get the goal-directed behavior. So that's the third level. Uh, then you have non-conscious deliberation, deliberation being cognitive. So uh, you have non-conscious cognitive deliberation. And finally, conscious cognitive deliberation. So behavior, you can't just say, well, um, you know, a person and a a rat are both in danger and both are responding the same. You can't just say, well, because they're responding the same, they feel the same thing. Because not all behaviors reflect feelings in humans. A person can be in a very dangerous situation, um, and yet their heart is flatlining. Uh, and maybe they don't feel any fear at all, you know. So, person, let's say, parent who goes in to save their child, you know, their heart might be racing and so forth, but their conscious fear is not there. That's all they're doing is like getting the the child out. Then afterwards, oh my god, you know. So, I want to move on um, <clears throat> to something that I think is a bit of a consequence of what you're talking about right here. Okay, if cognition of threat isn't caused by fear but is operating somehow parallel to it something we need to to maybe to understand better in the future we have some pretty convincing evidence against the limbic system concept and and the triune brain theories because yeah. they, they talk more about us an evolution of various systems i know you're quite a vociferous uh opponent to these two concepts tell us roughly what these two theories uh claimed and sure. why the new data uh, really proves them wrong well so um let's start with the limbic system because that actually uh, uh came first um 
the, these are both brainchilds of Paul McLean, um, who was a absolutely brilliant um, person and a theorist. And, you know, he's working in 1949, uh, writing in 1949. And he wrote a brilliant paper in 49 and 52. He wrote these two papers that together constitute the limbic system concept. Um, and they're, they're marvelous if you read them. Um, but they were based on, and well, so the limbic system, he said, was the emotion system. Uh, and, and it's a system we have because we've inherited the limbic system from, uh, from our mammalian ancestors. And um, before, the, before the first mammals, there was no um, uh, amygdala or hippocampus or any of the other limbic system structures. These were added with the arrival of mammals. Um, and so he got all this, and then he said, well, and then cognition, uh, is based on the neocortex, um, which happened in late mammals. So, uh, he said early mammals didn't have, late mammals had a neocortex, which is, you know, six layered structure and all the, that wrinkle stuff you see when you see a picture of the human brain, that's neocortex. Uh, and he said, that's cognitive and not emotional. Whereas the limbic system is emotional and not cognitive, very definitive, sharp distinction. So he had the he had um, um, the the idea that these he got this this idea from a, a, a German neuroanatomist named Ludwig Edinger, who worked around the turn of the twentieth century, and Edinger is famous for having said that. Evolution adds structures to the brain. And it, you know, it makes sense that you know, if you have uh if you're taking the brain apart and you know dissecting it and analyzing it, and you see structures that are there in this animal but weren't there in its ancestor, it must have been added. But that's such a crude level of analysis, you know, because the brain is not a, a series of you know stacked. Layers. It's not flaws on an apartment building. Well, let me back up. So in the 1970s, new research techniques came along for studying the brain in terms of detailed connectivity and microscopic analyses that hadn't been, been possible before. Uh, and the what's called comparative neuroanatomist people who study the evolution of the brain at that time, like Harvey Carton, who uh, was one of my mentors at, at Stony Brook when I was with Gasanica. Um, uh, and Glenn Northcutt and, and others like that, um, they, what they discovered was that the, all these things that were said to not exist in other animals, so in other words, like the, that uh, the limbic system structures first came in in, ma in early mammals, uh, they found those things in birds and reptiles. They weren't you know, as fully developed, but they were there. Edinger and McLean said neocortex came with mammals and was not in reptiles or birds, but that the new study showed that there were precursors of the neocortex in, uh, in, in reptiles. And then those went to birds and you know, the, the rest went to mammals. So some, rept some reptiles were the basis of the evolution of birds and the others were the evolution of mammals. So both birds and mammals got these precursors from reptiles. So it's it's not like the brain, that evolution is adding parts. It's taking things that are there and repurposing them, expanding them. Um, it's not making anything fresh and new. And it's, it's it's different. I mean, it's more complex and intricate, but it's not brand new. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, the idea that that the limbic system uh, made emotions possible in mammals. Uh, but did not exist in reptiles, so they could never have emotions, doesn't hold water. Mm. In fact, the entire idea of the limbic system is viewed as, you know, just plain wrong, that there, there's no definition of the limbic system that allows you to say, this part of the brain is limbic and this is not. It's like, it's a concept. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a thing. And yet, you cannot get this out of the literature. Um, 
things. I, I noticed someone did a, a study of a uh, textual study of scientific literature uh, for these kind of ladder-like theories of brain evolution, stack, things stacked on top of one another. And they're still prevalent in the literature. Scientists still talk about the limbic system. Psychiatrists, you know, say the limbic system is where bad uh, emotions come uh, in people. So we treat people by trying to fix their limbic system. If a psychiatrist does an imaging study and it's to study, I don't know, uh, let's say bad uh, schizophrenic thoughts, and all of a sudden the amygdala is activated, the interpretation is, oh, the patient must have been having emotional thoughts because the amygdala is activated. The amygdala does a million different things. It, it has one set of inputs and outputs that detect and respond to threats, but it's involved in a bunch of other stuff. So it's not a, it's not a thing that does something. You know, when we name brain areas uh, uh, in terms of functions, like we say, okay, the amygdala is a fear center, the amygdala now inherits all of the conceptual semantic baggage of the word fear, including the idea that fear is a conscious experience. So that's how the conscious experience of fear gets in the amygdala. Mm-hmm. The data on which the amygdala is uh, uh, implicated in these things is behavioral and physiological. But the interpretation is psychological because we've named it that way and reified it. Well, Joseph, why why is the field hanging on to these ideas? Are, are there some useful and elegant solutions provided by these old theories, particularly, let's say, rather in neuroscience, more into psychology, that, you know, is there anything we can salvage from uh, even with an updated conception of the brain? For example, on the show, we're going to be speaking to uh, the, the child psychologist that founded Hand in Hand Parenting for example, and she talks about the triggering of emotion beyond a certain sort of exacerbated limit leading to an interference, a sort of shutting down of the frontal cortex, if you like. Perhaps the solution to this, because we do, you know, really have some quite useful therapeutic methods that have been based on these erroneous ideas, is the solution really to sort of speak about physical responses and stress hormones and physical arousal, like you know, increased heart rate, rather than the corresponding emotions? Perhaps it's the use of the emotional language that actually yeah. is the problem and trying to match that onto brain rather exactly. than actually some of the, the beneficial ideas that can come out at, at a therapeutic level. What, what, what do you think? Is there anything we can salvage here? So, you know, the... Um, the problem is, as you say, the language. Um, now, let me give you an example from um, the effort to find medications for uh, anxiety. So th- there's nothing new that's been developed since the 1960s. Uh, when people, when researchers go back and, and try to find things that have, you know, that are better uh, treatments, that are more helpful to more people, uh, that have fewer side effects and so forth, they end up finding more benzodiazepines and um, uh, reuptake inhibitors, like serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So these are two classes of drugs that were known about, you know, decades ago that um, are that the field can't get past. And part of the reason is this. Well, so some of these drugs are discovered accidentally uh, by because they were given to patients for something else and the patients became less anxious. You know? So then they, they get put into that category. Um, but when you put a, um, a rat into a test situation in a pharmaceutical company, in order to develop a new medication, you, what do you have available? You have behavioral responses and, you know, maybe you've got some recording of physiological responses as well. Those are the data. But the assumption is, thanks to Darwin, is that the, the, these responses are due to a fear mechanism in the brain. And so the drug companies assume that because people tend to be 
afraid when they're running and their heart is beating faster and there's a dangerous stimulus, that if the rat is freezing or running in the presence of a dangerous stimulus, it's afraid. And because the amygdala is making is what causes those responses in the rat, and the amygdala in the human also is involved in those responses. The amygdala is the answer to everything. So you develop drugs, you assume that the drugs that are making the rats less timid behaviorally in the pharmaceutical study uh, are less timid because they're less afraid and anxious. So you give the drug to a person, it's not helping as much as we would like. So the medications are considered so unsuccessful the new, you know, finding new ones is so unsuccessful that the big companies, Glasgow, Smith, Klein, they're getting out of the business of trying to find new anti-anxiety drugs. And this example I like to use is a person with social anxiety. You know, she, she's told that she's going to be um, less anxious when she goes to the party, but when she gets to the party, she's still anxious. But she she was able to get out of the house. She was a little bit less avoidant and a less, less timid about going. Uh, but then was still anxious consciously. You know, she still felt afraid, anxious when she was there. So, you know, it's just been a misunderstanding about what fear is. You know, just a total conflation of behavior with mental states. And this a is the point of education, isn't it? Because if we if we could get this into the way um, the way doctors are taught, um, the way depression is understood. Uh, anxiety, then potentially we could have a much better understanding of what is up to the medication and what is up to the individual. So, yes, the um, you know we should use mental state terms to talk about actual mental states. We shouldn't confuse things by adding mental state terms to behavior and using that as the explanation. Mm, um, that's a good point. Joseph, I, I just want to quickly, because it, we're going we're gonna to take a, a break shortly um, and come back to talk about, in, the, in part two, to talk about your, your new book and the evolution of consciousness. But I just really want to get your opinion on this. Is it simply erroneous to think of the idea of um, threat uh, blocking our ability to reason clearly is that just simply not true i wouldn't say that uh, you know because when you're in the presence of a threat um you are um the, the same that threat is both going to your amygdala to produce bodily responses that are generating hormones that are flooding your brain, and so cortisol, you know, is a, it can be toxic if too high a level, um, and prevent the hippocampus from storing memories in a, a proper way, or prevent the decision making by the prefrontal cortex. Um, but so that's the that same stimulus is going to the you know these cognitive areas to give rise to the feeling of fear, but also to the amygdala to produce the responses. So it, the, the, the threat is going to affect the brain in a variety of ways, uh, both directly and, and as feedback from the body. Well, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because it means that a lot of the psychological models that at the time when McLean's theory was very, very popular, and a lot of people were referencing it when they were creating therapeutic models, that actually just with an updated view of the brain we can still see some of the actual real world examples of this happening and it can still apply and with an understanding of that we can shall we say i don't like the word but i'm afraid i'm going to have to cover it on the show the whole idea of hacking ourselves with our own awareness you know we can if we can hack that ability we can maybe stay aware and get out of that threatening situation in order to reactivate our ability to think clearly and 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 maybe deactivate the situation altogether and that's something i want to come back to in part two joseph because as i said i think we're in a we're in a difficult stage as a society particularly thanks to the internet and to social media where where we're just fueling each other's 
um, sense of threat and sense of difference and otherness. And as a result, we're actually not really able to think clearly about what is coming at us from these other people. Don't go away, listeners, because we're only just getting started here. In part two, we're going to get right into the evolution of consciousness, different ways of separating consciousness out so we can really learn more about it without getting too much into the into the hard problem. And we're also going to see, is there a way of avoiding the, the trap of dualism um, by really maybe following this idea of really just keeping emotional language out of the story altogether. We'll be right back with you for part two uh, in just a minute. So don't go away, listeners. So hello, everybody, and welcome back to part two uh, of this episode of Chasing Consciousness with Dr. Joseph Ledoux. It's been a fascinating part one, so do please go back to that uh, and listen to it if you are coming to this fresh. We had an extraordinary conversation uh, getting into Joseph's research about the amygdala, about fear, and about some of the consequences of that for the way we do psychology, the way we treat mental health and anxiety and depression. So I really recommend going back and, and listening to that. We also talked uh, a little bit about some of the problems with the limbic system theory and the try and brain theory. Um, but we came out quite hopefully because it seems that actually if we can just update our view of the mind, uh, and the brain, we don't necessarily, sorry, the brain, not the mind, that then we don't necessarily lose some of the wisdom that those theories were able to, uh, well, sorry, I should say some of the theorists who were using those theories of the brain uh, to create some really quite effective therapies. So let's come right back in there, Joseph. You you mentioned we need to really understand this difference between the state of mind and what's happening physiologically because they really need to be treated separately is that is is that the case let's imagine uh or just talk about what is the the usual approach that you have a treatment that is designed hopefully to um make someone less anxious and that, that implies that anxiety is a thing that is, it's a unified thing that can be altered itself and all will be well. Now, the way you alter it is by using procedures that are often designed to, uh, in, in animal studies, to change behavior or physiological responses. And you're assuming that the conscious experience of fear or anxiety is going to come along for the ride if you change the amygdala and therefore uh, reduce some of those behavioral and physiological responses. But I think that's a misunderstanding that you, the, the, the conscious experience of fear or anxiety, that feeling of fear or anxiety that you experience as an anxious person or a fearful person is actually what the problem is. It's, you know, the other things, it's, you know, the, I think of the behavior and physiology as um, kind of like, remember when we used to go to restaurants and dine inside here? I in, remember in, those right? days. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then invariably in New York, you know, they've turned the music up too loud and you can't hear yourself think. So someone says, hey, you ask the waiter, can you turn it down? So they turn it down. And let's say it was some heavy metal song and, you know, you, you hate heavy metal music. So it's still annoying that you, you're, that thing is playing, but it's less annoying with the volume down. And I think that's what the medications currently available tend to do is kind of like turn the volume down. Uh, but they don't, they don't change the song. The song is still anxiety and fear that's in your head. Now, so what that means is we have to treat these things as different things, they're not the same. Um, they're different symptoms. And you know, on the other hand, you can't simply, let's say you do have a way of successfully changing the conscious thoughts of the person. Um, you also have to treat the behavior and physiology because they're gonna, you know, they're gonna activate everything back up again. So if you treat one and not the other, the other one is always there to reactivate the one that wasn't treated. 
We we so, talked a bit about education in part one in terms of getting health professionals, uh, psychologists, psychotherapists to understand this difference. Do you think that this is slowly trickling into the awareness of therapists and psychiatrists who may use medication and who may use non-medical therapies? Is there an understanding that maybe we need both or is this just really not yet entered into the field? You know, I, I can't even convince a lot of my colleagues that, that do research uh, on these things that we shouldn't call behavior and physiology fear. You know, that scientists are, you know, brilliant, creative people often, yet stubborn. <laughs> and you know, it's been said that the scientist doesn't like any idea that he or she didn't have. You know, so it's, like, <laughs> it's like anything else. You know, they were people, you know, we have you know, egos and flaws and everything else. So, but yeah, so we, you know, every psych, every therapist wants the person to feel better. But I think because of the way that therapy evolved out of behaviorism, basically. So, um, you know, uh, the pharmaceutical industry was uh, manned and womaned by um, uh, people who had been animal behaviorists uh, at the beginning. So the methods that you used were behavioral methods to study, you know, animals to try and develop new medications. Um, and the assumption was if you you know, that medication is going to change the behavior and therefore the, the mental part will just come along for the ride. Uh, it's, it was kind of viewed as a, a non important part. It's just like, uh, the, you know, the messy part that uh, it's a poor reflection of the amygdala, as some people think of it today. The conscious experience is irrelevant. It's just a poor reflection of what the amygdala is really doing, which you measure with behavior. Uh, then the other approach, of course, was um, behavioral therapy, which then turned into cognitive behavioral therapy, which then turned into cognitive therapy. So all of those traditions sort of marginalized the middle. You say, well, cognitive theory is about the mind. Yes, but the the goal is often to change avoidance behavior or to change the, the habits of the person. The idea that you have to change the mind, you know, is viewed as like a leftover from Freudianism or something. You don't want to do that. So I think we have, the problem isn't, the research is all good. It's just, I think the interpretation and the assumptions that we bring into it and, and interpret it with uh, have uh, we've been looking in the wrong place and, and interpreting it. So, you know? so if for the listeners, there isn't any body or any any psychological model or any therapeutic uh, model out there, as far as you know, that is doing what you're suggesting. Well, they all do it, but they try to do it all at once. You know, the the, the idea that. I think, I mean, I'm not a therapist, so I'm, maybe I'm speaking out of term, but I, you know, people have said they agree with this. Um, the, the idea is that it's not, uh, that, that if you try to do all of that at once, you're asking different brain systems to each learn something. Uh, and it, it, it's like, you know, they're out of sync. So you gotta, I think you, what you, ideally what you could do is unconsciously change the amygdala. For example, so using these subliminal stimulations, uh, let's say you have a spider phobic, you present the spider pictures subliminally, a patient doesn't know it's there, so it doesn't freak out, uh, and you repeat it over and over again, exposure therapy, but subliminally, and that weakens the amygdala, kind of tames the amygdala. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the heart rate increase, you know, the hyper arousal and the avoidance behavior all go down. And now you can turn to the person's beliefs through uh, their memories and stuff, and now try to tame the hippocampus, which stores our memories. And then third, once you've got that, you now are ready for regular old psychotherapy, talk therapy, because now you want to talk to the conscious mind and deal, you know, help it change. There's no possible way that a medication taken through your mouth, dissolved in your stomach, entering the bloodstream can change the content of a subjective experience of a person. I mean, every thought is a different 
thing, you know? Well, can perhaps you... psychedelic, <laughs> but that is most definitely another conversation. No, it's a, that's a global, it's like a, a global change in how everything. So you can't target an anxious thought. We are going to be covering that, listeners, uh, in this first series, speaking to the uh, one of the scientists who's developed the SIDEP2 research <laughs> at um, uh, Imperial College. So don't worry, the extraordinary, uh, unique uh, idea of using psychedelics for this kind of work is definitely going to be covered in the show. So, Joseph, thank you for clarifying that point, which is a continuation from part one. I think that now we, you, you know, in part one, you laid out very, very clearly this sense of what, in your opinion and from your research, came first, and it's sort of working its way through these various levels of complexity of, uh, of brain science. So I think we've set the scene right quite beautifully for your new book, The Deep History of Ourselves, which traces this history of the evolution of brains right up to the conscious human brains we see today. What do we even mean by a conscious human being? I understand that rather than asking the big question of what consciousness is, which is, of course, the hard, the hard problem that we're all extremely curious about and we'll never know, you prefer to say, you know, uh, to, to think about how much, how we can find out more about it. So you've divided consciousness up into three succinct types so we can study it in more detail. Can, can you tell us about those three noetic types of consciousness? Well, it's not, I mean, I borrowed this totally from uh, the psychologist Endel Tolving, oh, uh, who wonderful. talked about this in terms of uh, memory. So he was, he discovered the difference, or, you know, created the distinction between semantic and episodic memory. Semantic memory is your knowledge of the world, your, the facts you know about things. And episodic memory is your, uh, the experiences you've had in the world. So you're in Italy. Let me give you an example involving Italy. Uh, a person who's never been to Italy can learn about Italy by reading a travel book before going. That would be semantic knowledge about Italy. But they can't have the experience of being in the Trattoria del Santo or whatever in Rome uh, without actually being there and having the experience and storing that as an episode in their life. Now, the thing about episodic memory, according to Tolvin, and I buy it totally, is that it allows us to time mentally time travel. That means we can visit our personal past, all of our memories. You know, John Locke said that the self is a bundle of memories about one's experiences. So this is what we're talking about. You can visit your personal past, and you can also anticipate your personal future not just the past and not just the future. In other words, a rat or a mouse can uh, respond on the basis of the past, but without this kind of uh, next, uh, well, let me, I'm jumping ahead, but without this ability to do mental time travel, it can't experience itself in the past, the actual things that happened to it, or predict itself in the future. And that mental time travel is a feature that goes with episodic memory. Uh, and the kind of, of consciousness that's involved there, Tolving calls autonoetic consciousness, autonoetic. Um, it is the this um, uh, you know, beyond noetic. Uh, it, it, I don't know why it's auto, but that's that's what it's called. <laughs> but it, it's about the personal nature of consciousness and, and your experience but it's associated with episodic memory. Noetic consciousness is the, the consciousness of facts about the world, is associated with semantic memory. And then he had a third category, which is a little hard to understand, which is uh, called uh, anoetic consciousness, which, you know, I, I kept trying, I kept having trouble with anoetic, what does that mean? And so I called him once and spoke to him about it. And he said, well, most people would call that like unconscious, which only kind of makes it even more hard to understand why it's consciousness. But I've lately, you know, really been digging into this. And a, a colleague of mine, Hakwan Lau, and I wrote a paper in um, uh, the journal Current Biology this year 
where we try to get into what that that noetic consciousness might be. And in the process, we kind of, you know, we're, we're dragged into the idea of um, something, I guess, that William James talked about, the penumbra of consciousness, of the, the fringe of consciousness. It's like barely there, but it is there. And that what's barely there is your knowledge of who you are. In other words, you, you don't have to... Um, uh, uh, affirm your mental states constantly on a, a, you know, you just have them and they're familiar because they're yours. You don't have to, to affirm that you're conscious of your body states. I mean, it's just, it's just there, but it's in, always in the background, unless you, you, you know, focus on, it, unless you attend to it and think about it. You can always attend to it and think about it, but unless you do, it stays in the background at the fringe. And Could you give us uh, a concrete example of this? You yeah, know, could so it be something it's like knowing that it's Tuesday without having to check kind of thing? Yeah, exactly. Uh, or no, knowing that it's me without having to check. So the, the reason this is uh, best understood is because there are people who have certain kinds of brain damage in the cortex uh, somewhere, I forget exactly where it is, um, but who um, don't feel their mental states are theirs or their body. You know, it's a different, I think it's different from both mental and body, but there's this dissociation from, of, the, uh, uh, of the, the ownership of your mental or bodily states, which you know, throws it into relief about how automatic it is because it's very disturbing when you, you you know you think these are not my thoughts or this is not my body i don't have that familiarity that uh, i have to affirm it and i can't affirm it but we never have to affirm it it's just there unless there's something wrong and so that's i think what this kind of automatic affirmation at the edge of consciousness that you can access if you need to, but don't normally because it's why would you bother? But the the, the value of Tolving's three parts is is really useful. You know, personally, I I don't think the question of whether animals are conscious is a good scientific question. I think they are personally. I treat my cat as if he's conscious. You know, he purrs. I, I think he's happy. He me he says he wants food. I you know I know what he means when he tells me that. I go give him food and. So I'm perfectly willing to attribute mental states uh, to animals in my waking daily life as a person. But when I put on the scientific hat, you know, I said, where's the evidence? And all we have is behavior and behavior is not a good one-to-one -one correspondent of mental states like emotions. If we look at what we know, that, and we don't know a lot about these things in the brain, but there's some minimal evidence that autonoetic consciousness uh, is a kind of metacognitive process about oneself, a kind of subjective awareness of oneself. So just and to clarify for the listeners, meta in this sense is an awareness of itself. Is that right? Well, it's, a cog it's metacognition. So cognition about a cognition. Right. But right. it's a cognition about one subjectivity. So it's even a little higher than a normal metacognition. Mm. So Steve Fleming at UCL in London has research that, um, uh, and he's got a book that just came out. You ought to talk to him. Mm. Uh, um, but Steve has uh, a, uh, a finding that this subjective awareness of ourself and our mental states involves a part of the brain called the frontal pole. And that's you know, the most frontal part of the prefrontal cortex, all the way in the front. Now, there's a part of that thing that is not present in other primates or any other mammal. So it's a kind of unique thing. It's not. It didn't come out of the blue because primates, non-human primates, have the other half of it, but they don't have this half that gives you that extra mojo of subjectivity. At least that's the idea. Um, but other primates and humans have what's called 
the lateral prefrontal cortex. It's more like on the side. Um, and this area has been implicated in, in human working memory and consciousness. Um, you know, if you're a fan of the uh, 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 global workspace theory of consciousness, uh, it's all about you know, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is integrating all this information. You know, I'm a higher order theorist rather than a global workspace theorist, but there are some similarities there. Um, so non-human primates have this. We don't know, I mean, we obviously don't know what's in the, the monkey's mind, but we know they have the this part of the brain and it's been implicated through behavioral studies and working memory. So they have the cognitive underpinning of what could be, you know, noetic consciousness, that an awareness of facts. But maybe they don't have that that subjective metacognition, that that extra cognitive thing that allows us to do the mental time travel and all that. Mm. So that would be your opinion. Oh, this is what separates human sort of a, a, a you know without being too arrogant about it advanced consciousness this is this autonoetic uh, meta ability is what separates us from from other creatures is that your opinion that's i mean i'm what i'm trying to do is you know i i is a it's a kind of we know that humans have all have noetic as autonoetic noetic and anoetic and so what i'm trying to do is say well here are the brain areas in humans that um, that underlie to to the extent we know that underlie noet autonoetic, noetic, and anoetic. I haven't talked about that yet. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can study those and understand in detail what those three kinds of consciousness do in humans, and you know how they're represented in the brain, then we can look at the brains of other animals, and if they have the same area that the sense they don't have the area that I think is autonoetic. If they have the area that's noetic, then that means at least they have the cognitive underpinnings of noetic consciousness. Whether they have the experience or not, we don't know, but they have all of the stuff up to that that spark of consciousness. You know, every every conscious thought is unconscious until that last spark that makes it conscious. Hmm. And because it's it's just a, like a train of information processing and representations and uh, trying to you know building up a kind of mental model of a situation. That's what cognition is doing. And, and you know we have a lot of mental models, but only some of it at any one moment is makes it into our conscious experience. But then the last part is that um, the anoetic states. Oh yes, sorry. Uh, are represented the the. the kinds of behaviors associated with those uh, are associated with the medial prefrontal cortex, the medial cortex, the limbic cortex, as it's called. Um, and so the, um, uh, the default network of the, the brain and all of this stuff. Um, and so it's, it's a, a system that, that is present in humans, present in non-human primates and present in uh, uh, mammals, non-primate mammals. So here we have these three things that that are different about you know, the mammalian brain, and then something unique in the primate brain, and then something unique in the human brain. So we can use our understanding of these things in humans to speculate about what primates might have consciously, even though we can't prove it, we could get some ideas about what they might have or probably have, may have, and then what ma other mammals have or may have. Hmm. You know, but without the problem is when we commit that they must have it, a rat must be feeling this because it's doing what we do when we do that. And th that that's not a that's not science. That's a, a, a passion. It's a, you know, a, a, an inference, a, an inference. And it, I'm all for inferences, but we need to separate the inferences from the, uh, the data. Absolutely. And that's what I tried to do with fear to say the amygdala is involved in these responses, but is not involved in the subjective response. And the subjective part in an animal is an inference and interpretation by a human who has those experiences and we're you know, plopping our anthropomorphic tendencies on them. You know, it's been said anthropomorphism is an innate feature of the human brain. <laughs> I mean, to, you know, to treat animals as humans was useful to our ancestors, 
as they domesticated animals for agriculture and, and so forth. You propose that that emotion is not a product of natural selection. Mm. Well, I, quite controversial, I, I imagine. There's a slight out of context uh, of that. I, that's what I do say. It, but what I say is it didn't arise initially out of natural selection. Right. Um, that it once it was there, it was selected and used. But, but the idea is that um, you know, Stephen Jay Gould, the uh, the late paleontologist, um, described something called spandrels, uh, which are things that are byproducts of other evolutionary processes. So, for example, the, the famous one he used to talk about was uh, feathers on reptiles were initially for warmth, but then they were useful in light reptiles for flight. And so they didn't, the feathers didn't make the made flight possible, but they didn't evolve to make flight possible. Mm. So what I'm saying is that what made emotion possible was the ability to um, have thoughts, to have cognition, rather than the opposite way that the Darwinian model gives us that, that emotions came before cognition. I say cognition came before actual emotions. I mean, we have all that behavioral and physiological stuff, but I don't think that's the emotion. So... You know, Do you get a lot of pushback from your colleagues on these two points about cognition predating emotion and and emotion not being the product of natural selection? How controversial? Uh, surprisingly little, but maybe they haven't read the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to the big stuff, Joseph. Uh, what are the implications of all of this for, shall we call it, the big problem of consciousness? Some people you know, uh, uh, refer to the famous hard problem. Doesn't the disconnect mentioned between emotions themselves and these psychophysical responses lead us into the old problem of, of dualism? I, I know you don't want to throw out this subjective experience as some reductionists do. On the contrary, you argue that we we can't understand any psychiatric reality without respecting the authority of this this subjective experience. How do you reconcile uh, a predominantly materialist view of the brain with an openness to the reality of subjective states? Is there a is there a middle road? Well, we have these experiences, so and they're not like you know in the ether; they're in our brains. So. Whether we can't, whether we understand, we don't understand them completely now. Whether we'll ever understand them in the brain, maybe not. I don't know. I'm hopeful, but they are there. Um, and what we can get to are those that cognitive buildup up until the spark of the subjective experience. You know, because it's like all that processing, and then bam, you're conscious of it. So there's a, a chain of processing that we can study and analyze. And we can study that in animals as well. But we know that in humans, we also have that extra step where it becomes a part of our experience. Maybe the other animals have it too. But, um, you know, I don't think, I see the dualism is between behavior and physiology and the emotion. But for me, the emotion is a cognitive process. I mean, we call it subjective experience because we experience it subjectively, but that doesn't mean it's non-material and non-physical. Mm -mm. So you, for you, there is there's no problem because it seems to me that I mean, how can we as as sort of non scientists rationalize this? I mean, surely we're forced to either claim that consciousness is an illusion, a purely you know physiological result. The subjective experience is just the result of, of brain chemicals, like Dan Dennett or, or maybe Sue Blackmore seem to to be pushing us towards this consciousness as an illusion. But isn't the the opposite also that that actually we're that, that, that physical reality has to have some basis of consciousness in it, as the panpsychists do. Aren't we forced to sort of choose one way or another? I mean, I choose. I, what I choose is I'm a materialist all the way. Right. And so for me, what it is is that it's that narration, that non-conscious narration. That's what I want to understand because to me, that's what makes the conscious experience. And, you know, maybe we can't study that final conscious experience, 
but we can certainly study that non-conscious narration and understand how that is. You know, so the the uh, literary critic uh, Roland Barth um, once said, "The writer doesn't write; language writes." And the the words we talked about this in Portland. The the thoughts are there; they come out when you're writing. It's just coming out. It's all being process, built up non-consciously. That mental model of what you know you write is non-conscious and, and it filters into consciousness. So that's what I want to understand, even if we never get to, I think the hard problem is you know, kind of out of, you know, that's a philosophical problem. Scientifically, what I want to understand as much as I can about the processes that we can measure and I'm, my interpretation is those give rise to the subjective experience. Mm. I can't uh, prove that. But uh, sorry to put on our philosopher's hat for a moment, because I know you're very interested in philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Does, doesn't that mean that we have to head towards a Dennett Blackmore kind of approach of, of saying that consciousness really is, is an illusion. It's a byproduct. Uh, you know, we have some quite grand ideas about, about our consciousness. Are we, do we need to be more humble about this and just see ourselves as sort of, um, you know, that, that our consciousness really is just a byproduct. Yeah. Well, you know, I, again, I think, you know, I'm, Janet and I would be on board up to the last moment when I think there is a physical experience of consciousness that is going to be very difficult to prove, but that's where, you know, that's where my thoughts are going. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. But otherwise, it's... Mike Gazaniga was, was reflecting some of what you were saying. He, he, you know, he, he was saying well, that's kind of the wrong question. You know, it's, yeah. very, it's very clear that these subjective states are, are real. It's just that they're on such different layers that there's just really no point in, in, in trying to reduce them to a simple correlation. Yeah, there's not going to be any little, you know, neuron or anything that we can find that's going to do that. It's like the best we can do at least given the current state of science, is to try to get at these underpinnings. Uh, and we have a lot of tools for doing that. Mm. So if I want to detour for a moment, uh, if, if you haven't got anything to add on that philosophical question. Uh, yeah, I have one other thing I want to talk about. but um, tell, uh, tell me, let's, let's go, go for that. Yeah, the, I just want to mention that the, uh, I mean, we, the book is, the last part of the book is about consciousness, but... The subtitle of the book is The Four Billion Year Story of How We Got Conscious Brains. And so um, the way I end up on consciousness is, you know, well, how what I did was I kept asking myself at the beginning when I started to write this book, or the reason I wrote the book is I went back and said, how far back does danger go in, uh, in life? You know, yeah, mammals have it, uh, reptiles, birds, um, fish. All the invertebrates respond to danger. And in fact, if you start looking in the single cell protozoa and in bacteria, they all respond to danger. Some of them even learn about danger and, and move away from it, approach nutrients and so forth. So these early behavioral uh, capacities of approach and withdrawal from useful and harmful things is, you know, goes back to the beginning of life. The first cell that ever survived long enough to reproduce, um, had to be able to detect danger and to uh, uh, acquire nutrition in order to stay alive. And so what happened you know, over the course of evolution is these things got more and more complicated. And we, uh, because we have conscious experiences, when we approach and avoid, we think that those things exist for the conscious experiences. But it's not about psychology at all. All these behaviors are going back to the beginning of life. They're simply tools of survival that the first cells had to, had to have and use and that we still have and use uh, throughout our lives. Our amygdala reflects that early withdrawal response from the uh, toxic chemicals that bacteria are exposed to. Mm. And so this this is really important for the book and and listeners you must go out and and buy a copy of this book and and get a better sense of it for me it is it is very very 
complicated. So I would really, uh, really love to 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 understand it better. But so, one thing good about the book is that each chapter is about fifteen hundred to two thousand words. Uh, so the complicated thoughts can be just succinctly summarized. There are a lot of chapters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's bite-sized. This is important. Okay. So listen, we're coming towards the end now, Joseph, but I do want to come back uh, to threat psychology for a moment. Um, I really feel like our society is in the middle of a, a bit of a crisis in terms of polarity and uh, argumentativeness and defensiveness. You know, I touched on some of this earlier about this sort of inability to actually reason about information. Um, we've also spoke to Jonas Kaplan, one of your colleagues, about the the backfire effect. You know, it just seems that we're in such a sort of charged fear defensiveness kind of state so much of the time. Yeah. That actually in the public sphere, we're, uh, on social media, even with our friends and family, we're finding it really difficult to just think and listen clearly to a range of opinions and, and consider them on merit, just reasoning about them. There's a load of mudslinging going on and not much genuine reflection. Do you agree that we're living in a bit of an epidemic to, of reactivity and defensiveness? You, you're probably aware that... Uh... Of Auden's famous uh, poem, 1949, The Age of Anxiety, um, that has been said to be the most talked about and least read uh, piece of literature that ever existed. Um, <clears throat> and so my students almost every year and every generation have said, why is my generation the most anxious? And then I refer them back to Auden's poem. Well, every generation since Auden has described itself as the age of anxiety, I say. But now I think it really is the age of anxiety because things have escalated so far, so uh, just so out of control in terms of, uh, as you said, the inability to, uh, to understand, to pay attention, understand, to reason, to look for, is this really true or is it just you know, something we've been fed? And there's so much of, so much feeding of information that's inaccurate that goes on uh, by way of the internet that it's, we're in a horrible, horrible box that I don't see how we ever get out of. Do you think that an awareness of emotions, anxiety, amygdala, the science that, that, that we've been talking about, do you think it can help mediate some of this antagonism and polarity? Could an awareness of what's happening inside us when we get triggered, when we become uh, hypervigilant and we can't reason so well, do you think that that could be a tool that, that we could offer to members of the public to, to sort of keep an eye on all of that? Well, you know, I'm again, I'm not a therapist, but um, I, I do think that, um, you know, knowing that different aspects of what's going on in a situation such as threat um, are distinct products of a common stimulus. So the, the threat is one thing, it goes into your brain and goes through many pathways, uh, and it has multiple effects. Mm. Uh, on how you're responding. Um, let me pause and just give an example of uh, what I mean from the study of pain. So if you see a person who's been hit by a car and is lying on the ground writhing, and, and what do you think? Oh my God, the person is really in pain. And yes, the person is, but all of those responses you see are reflexes. They aren't the pain. and you know, we can't, our, our behavior, we're so accustomed to jumping to a conclusion based on behavior about what's happening in the mind. Now, you know, the good news is for all of this is that our, our fears, our anxieties, our emotions are all in our minds. And if it's put in the mind through past experience, it can be changed by new experience. But you have to be able to be open to that. And I think that is, um, you know, that is the only way we as a species are going to survive, is if we somehow find a way for 
humans, independent of where they were born, where they live now, uh, who their leader is, to um, be one. You know, we are a species. That is how we exist amongst each other. And unless we come together as a species to solve problems like global warming, it'll never get done. One country doing this, another country doing that is not going to help. We need at least our leaders to come together as one organism that has the idea that you know the most important thing is the future of our planet, not the future of my career. <laughs> you know, you, you can't just make decisions based on you know your country or your your personal desires. You have to do this if you're a moral person and a politician. You need to do this on the basis of what's right. And there are obvious things that everyone knows is right, but that aren't done. Um, so, you know, I think that, that that's our that's our really our only hope that the the Earth will be fine. Um, you know, this has been evaluated. It's, yes, the, the the Earth as we know it is going to change. The planet will change, but it's not going to go away. It's like a, you know, it's going to exist whether we exist or not, and. A good lesson is what happened to the big energy demanding uh, creatures called dinosaurs in their age because they used and, and needed so much energy when the climate change took place. Uh, they couldn't survive, but tiny little mammals could. Mm. And those tiny little mammals, with the dinosaurs gone, were able to expand their territories evolve into millions and millions of kinds of mammals and uh, that uh, now are the dominant species on earth, all because the big energy demanding dinosaurs were in the way. Now they, then they weren't, now they, then the, the mammals uh, thrive. And we are in a position now that we are the energy demanding big creatures. So, you know, our footprint, our carbon footprint is huge. And, you know, we may not survive, but certainly bacteria will survive and start all, the whole process all over again. Uh, maybe some other small creatures will survive as well. Oh, maybe that's actually a sort of, uh, maybe that's the way evolution works in the really long yeah, term. Is that's that, right. That, have we're, you, in, we're in the way of everything else. Get us out of here. <laughs> well, my mother always used to laugh about this. So she's... Uh, uh, quite quite a serious christian but she always used to laugh and say well it may actually just end up being better for everybody if we just die off and oh, well. i thought that was very <laughs> funny uh coming from a, a a serious christian yeah but um joseph just to close then is there uh, coming back to to emotions and coming back to fear and shall we say a Fear, quite a fear-led society i mean you mentioned careers and selfishness there that you know that maybe maybe our sort of focus on our fear and our focus on our, our anxiety you know is what is separating us do you is there anything coming out of your research that you think shows us a, a way forward is there something that you think could be offered coming out of your lab that can show us a way forward in a sort of broader sense just to close well, my lab is working on the, you know the basic processes of how the brain detects and responds to danger. All of this consciousness and you know, high-level speculation stuff is uh, just sort of my, you know, my big Pop. picture interest stuff. Um, but so out of that, I think what's important to realize again is that you know our minds are uh, where we experience our thoughts and feelings, and. That's where they are. We learn to be, uh, to have, we develop mental patterns and habits that uh, become detrimental. But if we can learn them, we can unlearn them, you know, but we have to have the right understanding of the fact that certain things like the subjective experiences are not the same as the behavioral and physiological responses. And that as long as we marginalize subjective experience as the endpoint of a therapy session, you know, I know every therapist wants their patient to, to be better subjectively, but unless you make that the target, the goal, not the change of the behavior, I mean, you change that behavior on the way, but ultimately the person has to feel better 
if it's going to be a success. Well, I think that is a wonderful point to close this this brilliant conversation. And I'd like to thank you really, really very much because it's such difficult territory for, for, for us in the general public to navigate. And you've made it really, really easy to understand. And um, I look forward very much to, uh, to to seeing what else is coming out. And thank you for all of the suggestions as well. Other brilliant thinkers. Uh, we'll make sure that gets into the show notes. Joseph, wishing you very much the best with, uh, with the rest of your career and for your music as well. And thank, thank you. you so much. It's been a pleasure. 